Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I am your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you things that I think are important, things that you should think about, maybe even do something about. As always, comments, questions, reactions, uh, general statements of, I think you're cool, whatever, can be sent to me directly. Uh, the email address is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And uh, if you didn't catch that, go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can leave a comment there, or you can get the email address from there. Uh, if you do email me, two requests, again, as always, uh, include something in the subject line so I know it's not spam, and two, be a little patient about getting an answer, because I tend to be slow about email, but you will get an answer. All right, with that, let's get to it. As I try to do every week, I like to start with some good news. Um, and here we've got an interesting bit of good news, actually. Uh, the no-fly list, this no-fly list maintained by the U.S. federal government has been what one writer accurately called a Kafkaesque quagmire uh, ever since it was first enacted in the wake of 9-11. This list bans people uh, accused of or just suspected of some kind of links to terrorism. It bans them from boarding flights of commercial airlines. The list is secret. There are no clear rules as to how a name gets on the list. There's no way to know if you're on the list except by trying to get on a plane. And if you're on it, there's no way to find out when or why you're on the list. Uh, and it's almost impossible to find a way to get off it. Another secret here is how many people are actually on this list. As of last year, the FBI said it contained about 20,000 people, about 500 of whom were American citizens. Um, there's no way to know if that's an accurate number because, again, the list is secret. Consider that the year before, we were told it had eight to 10,000 names. All right, now, finally, 12 years after it was first instituted, some justice has been done. On June 24th, U.S. District Court Judge Anna Brown ruled that the no-fly list is unconstitutional because it gives those who discover they are on that list no meaningful way to challenge that decision. The ruling came in a case uh, filed um, under the, uh, uh, by the ACLU. Uh, was filed by the ACLU uh, on behalf of 13 Muslim Americans, four of whom are military veterans, who were branded with this no-fly status, in effect told they were suspected terrorists. Judge Brown ordered the government to come up with new procedures to allow people on the list to challenge that designation. Quoting her, the court concludes international travel is not a mere convenience or luxury in this modern world. Indeed, for many, international travel is a necessary aspect of liberty sacred to members of a free society. Accordingly, I'm still quoting here, accordingly, on this record, the court concludes plaintiffs' inclusion on the no-fly list constitutes a significant deprivation of their liberty interest in international travel. Now, I should note to be to be accurate that the the feds claim that there is actually adequate means of getting off the list contesting the ban but in fact that procedure is unwieldy and basically it's ultimately completely ineffective well the feds say well in that case uh, you could actually just uh, go directly to a u.s appeals court for relief <laughs> right the first person to successfully pursue that course was a former Stanford University student named Rahina Ibrahim. It took her nine years. The case started in 2005. It was only settled in January. And according to her lawyer, uh, Elizabeth Marie Pipkin, who she, she with a team of lawyers actually pursued the case pro, pro bono. Um, Pipkin said that the case cost $300,000 in legal fees and, uh, and court costs, rather, and ran up $3.8 million in legal fees for some 11,000 hours of work. And what's more, the decision fe uh, 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 featured a sealed court decision, which, when it was released, had some very, very strange redactions in it. So, yeah, no meaningful way to challenge being on the list does seem like an adequate description. Now hopefully Judge Brown's ruling will be upheld on appeal. Now that would be really good news. All right, going on from there to an update on something I talked about two weeks ago. 
Uh, at that time, I gave George Will uh, the Clown Award for his column, uh, in which he said being a victim of sexual assault was, quote, a coveted status, unquote, at colleges and universities, complete with, he said, privileges. Now, he was roundly condemned in other places as well as here, uh, and in fact, he recently got hit in the best possible place, his wallet. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch has announced that it will no longer carry his column. It said in a note to readers and indicated that Will had crossed the line, and in fact, it referred to the column and said, quote, we apologize for publishing it. Now, in the wake of this, there were, of course, the usual mutterings from the right about censorship and some highfalutin talk from the left about let him speak. Um, but the fact is, George Will has no more right to a nationally syndicated newspaper column than I do. In fact, sometimes I think he has less of one. But anyway, here, the thing is here that what I say is right on St. Louis Post-Dispatch. As any parent knows, or at least should know, uh, bad behavior doesn't change if there are no consequences. And, and, and more than that, you know, I don't want to hear about consequences to George Will over this. I really, I really don't want to hear about it. Because any consequences that he has suffered are a fraction of the consequences of sexual assault on the women that, that, he, that he belittled as little more than status seekers. There was a study that was just uh, printed in the, in the current, the June issue of a journal called Gender and Society. And this study concluded that there were several reasons why girls and young women do not report incidents of abuse. But a major reason, significantly a major reason, is that they regarded sexual abuse and violence directed against them as normal. They regarded, they had been socially, socialized to accept the grabbing, the groping, the unwanted fondling, in fact anything short of actually physically forced intercourse Anything short of that was a routine, even expected part of life. That's what we are putting women through on a daily basis. And that's what George Will is content to see continue. By the way, just as a bit of a footnote to this, studies such as this one uh, revealed that we are socializing young women such that they are expected to accept being the target of unwanted sexual aggression. Related to that, I would also hope that there are studies, maybe there are, uh, but I would like to see studies on how young men are socialized such that they are expected to be the source of sexual aggression. Because if you want to be ostracized, here's how you can do it. Be a 16-year-old boy among a group of other 16-year-old boys and say that you would never cop a feel even if you could get away with it because that's just not the right thing to do. See what happens. All right, moving on from there, uh, on to uh, one of our regular weekly features. It's the Clown Award, given as always for meritorious stupidity. This week, the, bitter, the, the winner of the Big Red Nose is Google, whose motto, Don't Be Evil, is ever more internally contradictory. Actually, to be more specific, the target of the score in this week is YouTube, which is wholly owned by Google. YouTube has become a major source for streaming free music. Uh, in fact, it gets something like a billion hits a month. In fact, I was just listening to a bunch of Phil Oaks songs just, you know, on YouTube just the other day. In fact, you know, but anyway, the thing is always looking to make a buck for itself and its Google-eyed parent. Uh, YouTube recently made a pact with some major record labels that would create a premium service uh, available to consumers for a subscription fee, a premium service featuring ad-free music. Now, last week, a number of indie labels came out against the plan, arguing that the terms of the deal favor, favor the major labels uh, as opposed to the smaller ones. In response, YouTube announced that, quote, in a matter of days, unquote, it would blacklist any artist or recording label that refused to sign on to the agreement. That is, if you didn't agree to join the subscription service, you'd be booted off YouTube entirely. Now, the Music Producers Guild, this is a, a membership-based uh, membership group of, of producers and engineers in the music industry, lambasted Google's subscription model and what it called the company's abuse of its monopoly and associated market power. 
as well as lambasting the impact this plan would have on, quoting again, funds available for innovative and creative content in the future. In fact, indie labels right now account for roughly a third of the music, uh, music industry's market share. Well, as of June 23rd, YouTube had not yet begun removing content owned by labels that had not agreed to their ad-free premium service. But frankly, that doesn't matter. The fact that you would even consider it marks you, in, in fact, it marks especially your corporate masters at Google as what we've long suspected Google to be, a money-grubbing, toad-sucking clown. From there, our other regular weekly feature, this is the outrage of the week. On Monday, June 23rd, a federal appeals court in Washington, D.C. made public large portions of that Justice Department memo you've doubtless heard about that deemed it was lawful for the CIA or the military to kill Anwar al olaki an American citizen in Yemen, based solely on the administration's internal unreviewable decision that he was an operational terrorist leader whose capture was not feasible. The memo was completed more than a year before the actual September 2011 uh, drone strike that killed Olaki uh, and actually killed at the same time another American, Samir Khan, who was not specifically targeted uh, but apparently deserved to die because he happened to be standing nearby. Now, knowledge of this memo has been out there for some time, uh, and bits of information about it have leaked out over that time. Uh, the ACLU, uh, actually, uh, a Freedom of Information Act that was filed by the New York Times and the ACLU demanded the release of this memo, uh, providing, the, providing, it was said, the legal justification for this authority. Well, after battling the case for some time, the Obama gang, uh, faced with, an, uh, with the appeals court order for release of a redacted version of the memo, gave in after some senators threatened to hold up the nomination of its principal author, a guy named David Barron, to a position on the federal court if the memo was not released. Right, now, the thing is, we, again, we've known about this memo for a while. We've known about the we can kill the guy claim for some time. In fact, it was over four years ago, in April of 2010, when um, I responded to news reports about the decision to target Olaki, uh, the decision to say that, you know, we can kill somebody on our own authority. Uh, I wrote on my blog and directly to the White House, I wrote, Mr. President, just who the hell do you think you are? But the thing is, over the time we kept hearing about this legal agreement for why this was all okay. Uh, it was all according to the rules. It's all's fair and all that. Uh, they were, that is, the administration was, we were told, on sound legal footing, and we should just trust them on that. But now, after this court fight, we have seen the memo, or at least a version of it released by the court, and it's more of an outrage than ever. Barron took the premise, the, the premise he was presented with, that Olaki was an operational terrorist leader whose capture was not feasible, did not examine that premise in case he just accepted it, and then just declared that therefore it would be lawful for either the military or the intelligence uh, community to kill him, notwithstanding federal statutes against killing Americans overseas, and notwithstanding protections in the Constitution against unreasonable seizures, and about depriving someone of life or liberty without due process of law. And that's pretty much what it says. That's all it says, at least in the heavily redacted version released by the court. Think, I'm trying to make it clear here just, how, just what the outrage here is. I'm trying to make it sure that you understand here. This memo, this is not a tightly reasoned legal argument. It's essentially a list of talking points. It's essentially a list of assertions. It's, it's, it's premises uh, presented as conclusions. Conclusions that would apply not just to Alaki, but to anyone, this administration or any future administration, again, in its own secret, internal judgment, unreviewed and unreviewable by any outside authority, agency, or court, to be able to kill anyone, to apply this conclusion to anyone that they just decided themselves was a terrorist leader. What all this means is that the administration's vaunted legal reasoning, its supposed hard-nosed argument for why it's okay to murder, murder American citizens away from any actual battlefield, comes down to because it just is. 
We can kill anyone we think deserves killing just because. Hina Shamsi, director of the ACLU's National Security Project, said of the memo, it's hard to believe that it was produced in a democracy built on a system of checks and balances. And Pardis Kaberi, a senior attorney with the Center for Constitutional Rights, said the memo's content showed that the targeted killing program was built on, quote, gross, viola uh, gross distortions of law. Gross is a description of it. So, in fact, is deeply, ethically, morally, outrageous and we're taking a break and here we are back uh, I'm gonna spend actually very likely the rest of the show talking about a topic uh, that's kind of difficult to talk about on a show like this it's uh, Iraq and the reason it's difficult to sh talk about is because this is a weekly show, and so the day-to-day -day events, by the time you hear about them from me, probably have already been superseded by other events. So what I'm going to offer instead is some perhaps like disjointed, generalized observations about what's going on in Iraq. I'm going to start, however, with what's going on as it's presented to you by the mass media. Uh, in that image, what we have is the forces of a radical fundamentalist Muslim group called ISIS, which stands for Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, that the forces of ISIS have swept through a significant portion of western Iraq as the government army just ran away. Those forces now control the border crossings into Syria and Jordan and are threatening the capital city of Baghdad. Now that's actually mostly true, but it's not entirely true. And the way it's not entirely true is very significant for the future. Uh, the forces involved here are actually a, a range of Sunni militant groups. ISIS is the most prominent, it's probably the largest, but it's far from being the only one. And that could be very important in the future, and I'll come back to that later. It's also not true, by the way, that the army simply ran away. There was some resistance, but the army in the area was composed of a combination of Sunnis and Shiites, and the Sunnis were unwilling to go into battle against other Sunnis, and the Shiites wound up thinking, why should I risk my life in order to defend Sunni towns when my Sunni comrades won't do it themselves, so I'm getting out of here, and as often happens in battle, retreat turn into panicked flight. But What's more important is to realize what's really going on in Iraq. And to get a sense of that, uh, we're going to use a couple of maps. All right, first, th this first map here, this first map here, this is a map that shows, actually, I think it's from NBC. I think it's from NBC, so thank you for NBC to uh, letting me kind of adapt and steal your map. Um, but uh, this map shows where these uh, Sunni militants have made their gains in Iraq. All right, fix that in your mind, fix that in your mind, and now look at this map. This map shows the results of the Iraqi parliamentary elections in 2010. The dark blue areas were won by Sunni political parties. The yellow area was, run, was won by Kurdish political parties, the green by Shiite political parties, and the pale blue area by sort of like coalitions of Sunnis and Shiites. And you notice that little blue area kind of sticking up where the dark blue sort of almost completely wraps around it? That's Baghdad. All right, so look at this map, and now go back to the other one. The point here is that the gains that these militants have made have been in exclusively in heavily Sunni areas. Areas where the population is heavily or even overwhelmingly Sunni. What you are seeing here is not some outside force sweeping into Iraq to set up a new caliphate. What you are seeing, in essence, is a Sunni uprising against a Shiite-dominated, highly sectarian government in Baghdad. Our fundamental failure in understanding Iraq all along 
has been our refusal to recognize the extremely deep and extremely sharp sectarian divisions that exist and have existed in Iraq all along. Iraq is like sort of like an artificial nation. Its borders were set by the uh, League of Nations in 1921 for the benefit of Western nations and without regard to any natural, ethnic, or cultural borders. Now, right now, our federal government here shows some signs of recognizing this, as, as usual, too little, too late. But there are reports that the U.S. is becoming increasingly exasperated with Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Malikai. Uh, over the past three years, in the term since the U.S. troops have pulled out, uh, Malikai has stopped doing all of the things that actually led to the... Um, cooling of sectarian tensions in Iraq that actually led to the reduction in sectarian violence that happened in Iraq. He, for example, stopped providing payments to Sunni tribes. He stopped providing patronage to Sunni groups, instead giving them to Shiites. He started prosecuting Sunni politicians, jailing them, even killing them through death squads. Over a year ago, on the 10th anniversary of the invasion, I warned that, quoting myself, al Malakai is con consolidating his personal power on the road toward a dictatorship. Two months after that, I described how Malakai had been, again quoting myself, engaging in an increasing crackdown on political opponents, including making police raids on peaceful Sunni protest encampments. And in January of this year, I noted his violent arrest of a Sunni member of parliament on trumped up terrorism charges and the violent destruction of the largest of those peaceful Sunni encampments. At that time in January, I said this, and I'm quoting, the thing is, there has been a resurgence of violence in Iraq, including in the capital of Baghdad. Over 8,000 people were killed in sectarian violence in Iraq in 2013, the highest total since 2008. But blunderbuss tactics such as Malachi is employing are less likely to bring an end to such violence than they are to intensify it, as other Sunnis take up arms. As, still quoting here, as negotiations between government officials on the one hand and Anbar provisional council members and tribal sheikhs on the other fail, Iraq now stands on the edge of a renewal of outright civil war. Farid Zakaria, he's a CNN journalist who never found an international situation he could not oversimplify, still managed did to make a, a solid point when he said that what's happening now in Iraq, quoting him, was inevitable in the sense that it was predictable because we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 04, 05, 06, when the Shia government in Iraq essentially started persecuting the Sunnis, purging them from office, disempowering them in various ways, and the Sunnis started fueling and funding insurgency. That's what created the civil war in Iraq. And now, doing the same things three years later is producing the same result. But of course, it's only now, now, that with, with disaster at the doorstep, it's only now that we're pressing Malachi to make some kind of political overture to the Sunnis in order to create a political opposition to ISIS among the Sunnis. Now Malachi, for his part, he's posturing and whatnot, figuring that if things get bad enough, we'll come in and save his butt. The U.S. is being reluctant to do that. Uh, the U.S. is flying uh, missions over Iraq, both, both the warplanes and drones, but all they're doing is watching. All they're doing is watching. In fact, uh, military officials even outright specifically deny rumors that there had been a single drone strike. Time magazine noted that U.S. military usually sends messages by attacking. Now it's trying to send a message by not attacking. Bluntly put, the U.S. is dragging its feet about defending Malachi's government, uh, taking what um, the Pentagon called a measured, deliberate approach to help us and the Iraqis get better eyes on the situation uh, with teams that are going to report back in two or three weeks. That's when the Pentagon will decide what it will do next. So, uh, you know, the point is they are deliberately going slow, deliberately dragging their feet on this, the whole purpose being to force Malachi to make concessions to the Sunnis. In short, Malachi and the U.S. are playing a sort of political chicken. The question is who blinks first, and how many die before that, and how many die after. The U.N. estimates that more than 1,000 people have been killed in Iraq in June, a figure the U.N. Right, the UN Rights Office said should be viewed very much as a minimum. 
Over 75% of the dead were civilians. Meanwhile, there are clear signs of a return to sectarian reprisal killings appearing in Baghdad. Uh, reprisal killings similar to the dark days of 2006 and 2007, when at that time every morning would reveal dozens of victims murdered for the crime of believing in the wrong version of Islam. All right, so what happens now? Well, first, it's safe to say that Sunni forces are going to find it harder going from here on out, uh, especially if they uh, stand by their declared plans of not only going to Baghdad, but going on to Shiite holy cities such as Najaf. Uh, in that case, now, they're going to be finding themselves increasingly up against well-armed, well-trained Shiite militias with combat experience, they, and who, by the way, will be defending, in essence, their own turf, not someone else's. And there's another issue about those Sunni militants, which is that ISIS has a crucial weakness. I note at the top, ISIS is the most prominent and probably the largest of the Sunni insurgent groups, but with maybe eight to 10,000 fighters in Iraq, ISIS does not have the numbers to take and hold multiple urban centers. It depends on its support from other Sunni insurgent groups and from the local population, which continues to see them as the answer to an oppressive central government. But ISIS has a record of violence, extremism, absolutism, and ruthlessness so extreme that even Al-Qaeda has disavowed them. And in Syria, they're as busy fighting other rebel groups as they are fighting Assad's forces. ISIS has repeatedly gained and lost local support. So there's a real question of how long that, for lack of a better term, Sunni militant coalition can hold together. And that's where the hope for a political sentiment lies, and uh, that this is not a battle of Iraq against an invading army of fanatics. It's a battle of politically entrenched Shiites against disaffected Sunnis. Sunnis who could, the thinking goes, be brought back into the fold with some concessions and gestures. My own sense, however, is that the U.S. belief that a new power-sharing agreement in Baghdad would soothe the anger among the Sunnis is hopelessly naive. Because, as Fareed Zakaria said, that we've seen this movie before. And if once bitten is twice shy, how shy is twice bitten? Why would the Sunnis believe any promises Malachi's government would make? Why should they believe them? What may come out of this, after the requisite bloodletting that seems to always be required before people come to their senses, uh, may be what some have predicted even advocated, which is an Iraq that's less a nation than a federation of three Iraqi states, one Sunni, one Shiite, one Kurdish. There's a lot more to talk about this, a lot more, and I should talk a lot more about the Kurds. I didn't, but I'm going to wrap up instead by saying that maybe things somehow will work out in Iraq because we have evidence that miracles do happen. Last week, someone said this about Iraq. Not one more life, not one more dollar, not one more airplane, not one more marine, not one more. This must end now. Uh, from the beginning, he said, is quoting him, from the beginning, he said, most people on the left were against going into Iraq. I wasn't. Liberals, you were right. We shouldn't have. The person who said that was Glenn Beck. Miracles do happen. That's it for this week. Uh, I got to get out of here. I'm out of time. So what you do is you just have the best week you possibly can. We will see you back next week. In the meantime, peace.